Play different. In 1980, Michael Toy and Glenn Richman released Rogue, one of the most influential games of all time. But if you want to hear someone talk about Rogue, go watch one of the thousands of other videos already out there. Instead, we're going to take a look at one of Witchman's solo projects, an incredibly unique arcade puzzle game with possibly the greatest name of all time. Orlando Poon's Toxic Ravine Cleanup and Rescue Service. At first glance, the game may look intimidatingly complex with all the buttons on the side of the screen, but it's not as complicated as it appears. In fact, most of the left is simply mouse controls for things the player can use the keyboard for, and I personally recommend keyboard over mouse. So the game is split into two phases. What you're seeing here is phase one. You fly your little blimp back and forth across the screen and drop bombs into the ravine, trying to clear everything out. Of course, there are some complications to this. For one, when you first play, you won't know how each kind of toxic waste will react to being bombed. Some will simply disappear, some will rise up towards you, some will explode into more waste, and more. Secondly, there are mutants that will fly up and radiate your blimp if you don't take care of them. And if you get too much of that unhealthy glow, it's game over. Thirdly, if you hit the bottom of the canyon, you will release toxic wraiths, who will also radiate your blimp. Though if you're clever enough, you can use waste to block up the hole until the ground seals itself again. And finally, sometimes hiding in the waste, you will find a Pang clone. And no, I do not mean a clone of the arcade game Pang. Pang stands for politeness and niceness gene, something I'll explain later. If one shows up, you don't want to kill them as that will lose you points. And this is very much a score driven game. Instead, you must lower a robot out of your blimp, navigate to the Pang clone, pick them up, and carry them back to your ship for extra points. But, you mustn't dawdle, because the robot can become radiated if it's outside for too long. There are other things which can help increase your score, such as destroying waste while moving at higher speeds. I should mention that, at first, it can be hard to tell which column a bomb will actually drop down, but eventually you get a feel for it, or at least, I did. Once all the toxic waste is cleared, it's on to phase 2. Phase 2 is quite a different beast. You still fly a blimp back and forth across the top of the ravine, but now it plays more like a mix between Lemmings and Tetris for the lack of a better comparison. On each side of the ravine are two sealed caves, or rather, they are sealed unless they are accidentally opened in Phase 1. And if that did happen, I highly recommend dropping a block in front of the entrances until you're ready. Inside these caves are more pain clones ready to be freed. It's your job to drop in blocks and elevators to help them climb out of the ravine and over the edge. Once they're all gone, either by being freed or by dying, the game ends. Once again, things aren't that simple. The first thing you have to worry about is yourself, or rather, making mistakes. Luckily, not only can you bomb structures which you've dropped, you can also use smart bombs which you can control freely to get into hard to reach locations. They can also be used as platforms if you're desperate. Then there are the pain clones themselves, you can be a real pain in the butt. Especially if it turns out your escape structure has flaws. They can get in the way and even get tired, which makes them sit down and stop any other clones from passing them. If this happens, you have to drop them some food to get them moving again, or you can just kill them. But why would you want to kill someone so polite and nice? There are also optional bonus items being held up by mutants. If a pain clone picks these up, you'll get bonus points. There is definitely a learning curve to phase 2, and it can feel pretty clunky at first. I recommend to take the option to practice this phase separately, and get the hang of it before taking on both phases in a row. It took me a few attempts, but eventually I got the hang of phase 2, and found it very rewarding building escape structures. There is something very satisfying about watching the little people climb up and out of the ravine thanks to your hard work. This game has a lot of personality, partly thanks to the backstory which is so long that I made a separate video for it. It's a post-apocalyptic black comedy, and I'll try to do my best to sum it up here. Orlando Poon Sr. worked for an environmentally irresponsible company and was trying to make super soldiers. Instead, he accidentally made a bunch of clones with the politeness and niceness gene who were useless for warfare. These clones were dumped into ravines along with other toxic waste, and Poon quit after becoming exposed to the gene himself 
and grown a conscience. His replacement succeeded in making the super soldiers almost immediately, naturally, they took over the planet and eventually got into a civil war, destroying each other along with most of the Earth. Poon Sr. died in this war, but not before tasking his son, Orlando Poon Jr., with cleaning up the ravines. He rediscovers forgotten technology and starts a company. And you are one of the people he has hired to clear the ravines and save the pain clones. In regards to the story, Witchman says the game mechanics came first and the story was backfield to fit them. He asked himself why one would need to hit these rocks and why he would need to avoid hitting the ground and it all grew from there. Environmentalism is also important to him so that ended up becoming a major influence. He also likes to infuse whimsy and absurdity into his work which is how it all ended up getting a little ridiculous. On the mechanical side of things, the major inspiration for Phase 1 was an Atari arcade game called Canyon Bomber. Back when Witchman and Toy were creating Rogue, he used the same technology to make an ASCII version of that game, mostly to save himself quarters. Years later, when he decided to take that same idea to the Mac, he got ambitious and started thinking of different kinds of things the rocks could do if you hit them, besides just going away. The pangs, and the robot used to collect them, were added when he started thinking of things that the player would want to avoid bombing. As for Phase 2, he says he doesn't remember exactly what influenced it. I brought up Lemmings, and he said he can't remember if he played it before or after he made Toxic Ravine, but it indeed could have been an influence as he loved that game. He also wanted to make a game where you won by saving people, not by killing them, as there was a lot of violence in games at the time, and also now. It's also interesting to note that initially the game was only going to be Phase 1, and the second one was added later in development. Though there is a lot of documentation, Toxic Ravine doesn't detail the behaviour of everything you encounter. Instead, it encourages you to experiment and find out yourself, similar to what Rogue did. Witchman says this was partly to save himself from writing instructions, something I can certainly relate to as a game designer. But he also thinks that discovery is one of the more rewarding parts of games. Thinking back on Toxic Ravine, Witchman says there are things he would do differently today. He occasionally thinks about dusting the concept off and even started a design at one point but became too busy with other work. One thing he says he would change is the difficulty. Even with options that let the player customise the game to their liking, Toxic Ravine can be a very unforgiving game, which he thinks got in the way of the feeling of discovery. Discovery, he says, is more rewarding if you aren't penalised too badly for finding something bad. He also felt that Phase 2 was too confusing and not many people figured it out. He thinks it was a fun idea, but the implementation wasn't great. If he was to revisit it today, he thinks he would take the basic concept of rescuing things from a place you have limited access to and starting fresh from there. That isn't to say that he isn't proud of the original game. In fact, he loved it, enjoyed playing it himself, and is happy that some fans managed to master it. But it also had a quite narrow appeal. I, myself, just happened to be one of the people it appealed to. Still, I would love to see him take on the concept again, even if it ends up quite different to the original. After all, will always have emulation if we want the original experience. Another bit of trivia about Toxic Ravine is that it received a boxed retail release, mm, sort of. There was a company called Pointware, which had the idea of selling games at grocery store checkout racks. They contacted Richmond, and for him, it was a no-lose situation. Pointware handled all the manufacturing and distribution and sent him a royalty. Sadly, they never got off the ground and Witchman doesn't think they sold any games at all. But still, he ended up with a boxed version of Toxic Ravine which he still has today. I was hoping to get photos of the box for this video, but Witchman was unable to locate it at the time of recording. If I ever do get photos of it, I'll make sure to share them in the usual places online. Later, a 2.0 version was released, with the primary changes being redrawn graphics, the addition of colour, customizable controls, and the behaviour of smart bombs had been changed slightly. But for the most part, it's pretty much the same game, and which version people liked more really came down to aesthetic preference. Ultimately, the challenge that Witchman set for himself in creating Toxic Ravine was to see if he could create a game completely on his own. The game design, the graphic design, the interface, the sound, the programming, debugging, 
everything. He feels he really succeeded there and proved to himself that he could do it. In the process, he made an incredibly unique game that has become a cult favourite on the Macintosh.